The roundtable session will be delivered under the theme Future Pathways to Development. And Mr. Mario Pezzini, director of the OECD Development Center, will serve as our moderator. So please welcome him and our moderators, uh, our speakers, with another big round of applause. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. What a better moment to start the day by discussing future pathways and uh, put some energy and fantasy also in our dreaming. We have to discuss, in fact, those paths because development has changed under our eyes. Uh, when I was young, we had a clear idea. There was one path of development. Certain country made it. Other no, and they could copy from the first come. What a wrong idea. This has demonstrated not to be the real approach to follow. There are different paths of development. Many emerging economies have achieved strong rates of GDP, and in many cases translated it into well-being, even if not completely, and therefore, there are, in reality, multiple ways in which development can be achieved. Moreover, now, technological change, demographic and geopolitical changes are further complexifying the picture. In this context, rethinking development strategies become a need. And to do that, the input that you can provide to us with your crucial work on statistics and, in general, evidence becomes fundamental. So how the old paradigms that we had in mind needs to be adjusted, and what challenges will country face is what we are going to discuss together today with a very, very good panel. Let me quickly introduce the members of the panel. Zhang Laiming, first, Vice President of the Development Research Center of the State Council of the People's Republic of China. I'm very happy that Zhang Laiming has been capable to be with us because China as the DRC as part of the State Council. In other terms, a structure that works every day in the cabinet with the rank of minister and vice minister to analyze the facts in order to design better policies and, and, and strategies. This is the point that we will discuss further. We have with us Kyung Ryung Song, which is the chairman of the Korean National Research Council for Economics, Humanities, and Social Sciences. Those that have been uh, working with Korea, as I did from uh, even before the beginning of this millennium, uh, knows how crucial are the centers like KDI, Chris, and many others that exist in Korea and accompany the work of ministries. And now in Korea, it has been created an umbrella that coordinates these different centers. And here we have the person in charge of that umbrella. Again, another example of a government that has, within the structure of elaboration of policies, analysis, and thinking. I want to stress this point because, as in my past, I was also an official of the government of France. I was working with the so-called Commissariat au Plan, but it has been dismantled. And so it's not so common to find in government this type of structure. I'm not saying uh, centers that cooperate with government. I'm saying centers that are in the government. Together with us, we have also Ong Jo Ham, which is the Deputy Executive Secretary of United Nations Economic and Social Commission for Asia and Pacific. Good morning. <laughs> UNESCAP is working on a wider region Asia, and UNESCO is part of the 
system of United Nations, and actually the regional commission are in charge of the implementation of the SDGs at the regional level. So it's crucial to have here actors that with a look at regions can discuss what needs to be done to implement these agreed objectives and goals that we have defined. And the experience that he has will be very helpful for our discussion as the other person coming from uh, the, uh, another United Nations Economic Commission, which is Mario Cimoli, Deputy Executive Secretary of the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean in Latin America. So now, if you have to refer to us, he is Mario 1 and I am Mario 2. No, I am very happy no, to introduce also Lisa Bersales, Vice Minister and National Statistician and Civil Register General, Philippine Statistics Authority. Thank you very much. And Lisa is adding major changes in the statistical system and also the administrative system of her country, she will tell us. Last but not least, we have Ravi Kambur. Uh, Ravi, which is lead professor of World Affairs in Cornell University, has been in charge of many other responsibilities, among others in the World Bank and others. And Ravi is a thinker on the matters that we are discussing. Therefore, we will uh, uh, use and exploit his wise knowledge in this respect. <laughs> Let's now enter in the crucial point of the discussion. And you know that you can elaborate questions or even raise your hand at the end of two rounds of questions that I will address to our participants. So, let me start first with uh, Zhang Liming. As I said, uh, the DRC, Development Research Center of the State Council, elaborated, contributed to elaborate a very important strategic thinking concerning China. In fact, I will invite you to go and read again, if you have already done it, or for the first time, the so-called China 2030, a report that was written by DRC and the World Bank. And it's very funny, in the discussion about China, you, when you read the newspaper, you have the impression that China has to react to many challenges every day and so on. But if you read that book, you will see that China had already conducted a serious analysis and a very clear vision. And what is happening in many cases is the implementation of that vision. What we have called the definition of a new normal. The accumulation phase may be uh, the first original one over, and now there is a need of a new model of development. And that's what was described in that report and obviously described by the position of the party and even President Xi Jinping that announced this idea of a new normal. So my question is, China has a very well-known success in designing strategies and in implementing the five-year plans. So these plans uh, have been shaping a kind of new paradigms? What is the relationship between this new normal vision and the plans that have been introduced? Um, Zhang Liaming will be transla uh, translated, therefore he will express himself in Chinese, if I understand well. So please, the floor is yours. Oh, yeah. Oh, thank you, Mr. President. 大家早上好 
，解决温饱问题。第二步，到了这个小康，全面建成小康社会。第三步，到本世纪的中叶，建成中等水平的发达国家。从那时起到现在。实际上，我们是一直按照这样的一个战略规划在进行建设、发展的。那么呢，到今天，第一步、第二步的战略目标或者是发展目标都已经实现。我们现在进行的，实际上是从全面建成小康社会到实现现代化这样的一个过程当中的规划。那么呢，去年呢，中共的十九大呢，又对这个时期的规划呀进行了细化。那么呢，它的发展目标就是到二零二零年全面建成小康社会，到二零三五年就是初步基本实现现代化，然后到最后按照。邓小平先生当年的规划，到二零五零年建成现代化国家这样的一个，所以他这个规划，它是一个长期不断的衔接的这样的一个过程。正像刚才毕志尼先生讲到的，一个国家的发展战略也好，发展规划也好，发展道路也好，都是有自己的特点的。这个特点跟他的基本国情、资源禀赋。历史文化发展阶段都是紧密结合的，各个国家可以互相学习、互相借鉴，但是任何照搬的是从来不成功的。我们当年就曾经照搬过苏联的模式，呃，包括我们的五年计划都是苏联人第一次教我们的，但是现在看起来并不成功，所以后来在总结经验教训的基础上，我们又完善了我们的。规划方式，规划我们的，完善了我们的发展思路，就是后来有了中国的改革开放，就是这么来的。那么到今年是改革开放四十周年，在这个四十年的过程当中，我们对自己国情的认识，对世界形势的认识，也是在随着时间的发展，在不断的演进。实际上，在这个过程当中，也是在不断的调整。到现在为止，我们已经到了。十三个五年规划，这个规划是要管到二零二零年的。现在对中国社会发展的一个战略谋划的两个重大的文件，一个就是“十三五”规划，以前制定的；还有就是去年的中共十九大对整个中国发展的一个规划，就刚才我介绍的。从发展理念上来讲，已经有很大的改变。不要说就是。十年前、二十年前、五年前有很大变化。这种变化，它首先是因为国际形势、国际环境的变化，还有一个中国自身本身的发展进程在不断的向前推进。推进到一个什么阶段呢？我们的认识是，要从过去的追求数量型的扩张，我们叫高速增长，把它转变到发展的高质量发展，注重经济发展的质量和效益。因为大家也有印象，过去我们主要是靠生产要素的投入，所以呢，一个就是资源的大量的消耗，环境的大量的损害，还有就是人民群众投入了大量的艰辛的体力劳动创造的。但是这个发展模式，我们认为在现在情况难以为继。那么现在我们新的战略思维就是要推动。创新发展、协调发展、绿色发展、开放发展和包容发展，这五大理念本身就是解决现在当前中国发展的现实问题的一个基本的思路。因为现在我们要更加强调创新，没有创新，我们的产业机构就无法提升。还有一个就是这个区域协调发展。因为中国，你们各位可能去过中国。中国呢，现在是一个非常多样化的地方，城市和乡村各地发展的
差距相当大。那么现在成了个现实问题，那么我们就要使它的发展的差距能够逐步的缩小。还有一个绿色发展，现在我们花的劲头很大，因为我们已经吃吃了很多环境上面的亏。环境方面的测试，现在在我们的这个老百姓当中、政府的决策当中是花很大的力气。现在采取一系列的措施，想尽快的恢复生态。还有一个就开放发展，大家也感到，我们认为像 OECD 所倡导的一样，我们要顺应经济全球化发展的大势，能够在世界范围内更好的互相的补充、互相的进行这个叫各各取所长。进行生产力要素的组合，那么开放发展，包括最近中国领导人采取的一系列的措施，包括最最近搞的这个进口博览会，展现的就是这样一个开放发展，这个世界一起发展。最后一个就是共享发展，就是最后就是正像别子李先生跟讲到的，我们的发展也好，它最终是要让老百姓的生活的幸福感、获得感。安全感在上升，那么最后你的发展成果怎么能够体现到老百姓的分享上面去？我想中国在这方面现在也在继续做出努力。我想啊，呃，我们既然已经找到了这样一条新路，在不断的努力下，我们会向目标不断的奋进，同时在这个跟世界各国的交流学习当中，取得现代化建设的经验。我要讲的就这些，谢谢大家。谢谢。Thank you very much. Um, yes, uh, everything very interesting and very important for our discussion. Let me, let me pick up one point that I think is crucial. Um, a friend of us in Harvard used to call with a strange name an attitude which is pretty disseminated. He called it uh, isomorphic mimicry. It would be the attitude that sometimes we international organization and other may have to uh, suggest government to copy the policies that others have put in place. And uh, uh, this professor in Harvard uh, used to say, it would be as if you have a beautiful tree in your garden and you decide to move it to your country's uh, uh, house, if you have one. You cut the tree and you bring in your country eyes and it will disappear instead of reflourish. Obviously, because you have left the roots elsewhere. This is a crucial element that we have to keep into account. It's not copying that we can uh, identify policy and strategies. They need to be based on the specific institution and context. And one say, yeah, but at the end of the story, the institution are the same. Look, we all need a governance like many country have and so on. Here we have a country which is absolutely the example of the opposite. In many cases, we have said in the past, if you want development, you need as a prerequisite a Weberian bureaucracy. It's obvious that China developed without having, in part because colonialism destroyed the uh, bureaucracy that existed before. So uh, this idea of pure copying or dissemination of similar practices is probably an idea to be revised. And we have a second speaker here with us, a panelist that can help us in clarifying ideas and vision. Because Kyung Ryung Seong uh, is dealing as well every day with this type of problem. And Korea is another country with a bright trajectory of development. And therefore, my question is, in the everyday work that you are conducting, in your, and in particular, you said also in your inaugural address to NERC this year, uh, you laid out your vision of the risk that Korea is facing. So again, in defining the pathways for the future, what do you think are the challenges and how do you see them for Korea? Okay, thank you very much for you uh, to remind me of uh, my uh, inaugural address delivered in last February. In that address, I pointed out that uh, Korea is at great risk. That is, although Korea has achieved uh, great successes, 
in economic growth and uh, uh, human development uh, for the last five decades. It now faces serious multifaceted, multidimensional problems like uh, uh, rising inequality, tendency for economic decline, um, many types of social uh, conflict, and especially unprecedented uh, risk of long-run population decrease. Uh, you may be surprised to hear about uh, how serious uh, population decrease is in Korea. Last year, uh, the total fertility rate was 1.05. This year, it is estimated to be uh, below zero, 0 0.97. Um, all these, uh, I think, uh, are uh, result from um, the past uh, development model. So, I argued in my address that uh, these problems basically result from the outdated policy doctrine of uh, growth first and uh, distribution later. Uh, and also improper policy package that have been implemented for more than five decades. So I'm very worried that the, the bright side of Korea, so-called Korea miracle, may soon be overshadowed by the dark and the tragic side. Therefore, if strong reform measures to make Korea a more inclusive and more sustainable society are not taken soon. Korea is very likely to plunge into a stagnant and withering society. So this is a real challenge that Korea has to tackle without hesitation. Thank you very much, and thank you very much to be so frank and so direct that that's what we need to conduct this discussion, and more in general, to conduct our work. Um, excuse me if I don't follow the order of the, of the chairs, but everybody that knows me I, knows that I am a little bit anarchist. So uh, I would jump immediately to uh, Ravi Kambur, because Ravi, we have heard of the fact that the strategy is not once for all, that you have to adjust it. In particular, in the case of China, if we use some economic terms, the so-called Lewis model of uh, unlimited supply of labor for China is over, and therefore now you have to deal with other sources of competitiveness that are with innovation and so on. And on the other hand, we heard Korea had a certain model of development, but now it, it is coming at a series of bottleneck that needs to be seen. If we broaden the view, then we realize also that in many cases, we are confronted with a certain anxiety on the side of the public opinion and on the side of, uh, I don't know how to call it, the people in general. So what accounts for this anxiety uh, in this time? Uh, most economic and social indicator may have shown, may have shown improvements at the global level uh, in these three quarters of a century, but there is this anxiety. So what is the explanation that you give to it? Good, well, thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mario. And I think that's, uh, that's the paradox, in a way, if one thinks about global performance. Uh, as you say, it's actually over the last three, quor uh, three quarters of a century, it's been quite remarkable. Uh, if we compare, if we can consider, for example, China or India, uh, growth in per capita income in these countries over the last uh, 40 years has been greater than the growth in the last thousand years in these in these countries. Okay, that just shows you the extent to it. Then you say, well, it's just average income. No, actually, poverty has fallen dramatically in these countries. Also, uh, then you say, no, no, that's just income. No, no, you look at 
other social indicators, uh, life expectancy, infant mortality rates, etc., etc. There's been tremendous improvement in all of these things in many, many parts of the world. Of course, not everywhere, but in many. And yet, we have this anxiety. I think that's, in some sense, the paradox, how, how it can be. And it was put very, very nicely by our Korean colleague, the tremendous success, and yet we have this anxiety coming up. There are many reasons for this, but let me just focus on one, uh, which many people in this room and, and on, in, on this panel have worked on. That is the technological trends that we're facing. Uh, the technological trends that, we're, that we've been facing for the last 25 years and that we're going to go on facing for the last, next 25 years if, if something is not done about them, uh, is a trend which is displacing basic labor in favor of skilled labor and in favor of capital. Uh, this is, of course, present already uh, in the US. It's present in, in Korea. And I think e uh, even in a country like China, that, that, that worry is already present uh, about what's going to happen to employment as new technologies uh, uh, come in. And of course, if we allow, not allow, if, if these trends come through as they have been, uh, essentially it's a tr there's a tremendous effect on inequality. Uh, uh, the, the, the wages of basic labor will fall or there'll be unemployment in basic labor, and that's what we're seeing uh, around the world in, in, this, uh, in this context. So what's the response to it? And I think we can, we can think of it in terms of three types of responses. And actually, the OECD has, uh, uh, has sort of framed this in the following way, which is one, we can think of the so-called the pre-distribution, uh, the distribution of education, skills, et cetera. That's one strategy. The second is sort of regulating the labor market, let's say, in terms of minimum wages and so on. And I should say, China has introduced very strong minimum wage policy, and I think that's actually been an important part uh, of managing inequality in, uh, in China. And the, third, and the third part is redistributing after the event. So you have pre-distribution, regulating the market, and then after the market plays itself out to redistribute in this way. So those are three, if you like, standard uh, uh, things that we can think about. And uh, there's a lot of detail, and uh, I and many others have worked on the detail of this. But I want to raise one issue which is not as well discussed, just to put it, put it to you, which is the following. And this was a point that was made by the late uh, Tony Atkinson in his book, Inequality, What Can Be Done? And he raised the question, why should we take the trend of labor's, labor displacing technology as a given? Why should we accept that trend as given? Why should not there be public sector research and development to actually think about forms of, tech, forms of new technology or using new technology in order to generate employment rather than displace employment? And you know, when I say this, uh, people say, well, you know, you're, uh, uh, you're being like King Canute. You're pushing back the technology. Are, are you not just trying to push back the technology tide? And what can you do? This is just coming at us. And my response to that is, actually, in the past, the governments have changed the trend of technology. The internet is what it is today, not because the private sector uh, did this. It was because governments in, uh, uh, put in the R&D to get that going. Uh, the, we have the green revolution. We had the green revolution that we have today, not because the private sector developed this stuff, but because actually governments developed this stuff. The reason why Norman Borlaug, the great, the great uh, agriculturalist, was in a field in Mexico developing high-yielding varieties was not because a company sent him there. It was because the Rockefeller Foundation and public sector entities were put in there. Why? The objective was to change the trend of technology in this way. Mm -hmm. So I put it to you just as, a, as, a, as something for us to think about. Why should not we think in those, in those terms. Why should we not think in those terms? Again, as I say, people say, well, okay, give me an example of how you would do it. But that's not my, that's not my job, okay? Uh, that's, my job is not to sort of think of how I'm gonna use internet, et cetera. That's the job of the clever uh, uh, techie entrepreneurs who are, going to, who are going to do this. In fact, from here, I'm going to, uh, to Helsinki to, uh, to a meeting of, of I think it's to 20,000 startup young tech people uh, in, their, in their 20s. Uh, and they're flying in from Silicon Valley and so on. And the, and the issue I'm going to put to them is, suppose I was to set you this problem. How will you use this technology to use labor rather than displace labor? What would, what would be the answer that you would give, give me with all your clever brains uh, and all your entrepreneurial skills and, and, and so on? So I think if we, if we think of it in those terms, think of putting that question to this vibrant private sector and also bring in the government to have public sector R&D, which has actually been now reduced dramatically. Uh, the consultative group on uh, international agricultural research, which actually led the Green Revolution, has now been completely uh, reduced, in, reduced in its effectiveness. So that's my one point. I, we can discuss in detail all those things. But the one big point I would like to leave you with is, why should we take 
the trend of technology as given? Why should we not think about public sector and private sector cooperation to try and make the next, the next 20 years more labor using rather than labor displacing? Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Uh, very important point, how much technology is endogenous or exogenous, obviously, is a long lasting discussion. And you made very good example that demonstrate that in many cases is endogenous actually. And therefore we can have policy that orient these things. I'm sure that Mario Juan and, uh, and other colleagues will want to, to pick up on this point. But before moving to them, let me ask Lisa. Because Lisa, in the position in which you are in the National Statistics and Civil Register uh, General in the Philippine Statistical Authority, you are going through uh, some uh, analysis and recognition that income-related gouges alone are somehow too narrow to capture the complexity of your country development, but also to capture the complexity of this anxiety that uh, uh, Ravi was referring to. Can you tell us a little bit more how this anxiety, how do you explain it? What your data and your activity tell us about those in Philippines? Thank you very much, Mario. Mario too. <laughs> uh, I would like to first give context to my answer to you. Yeah. In the Philippines, three years ago, we developed our planning ministry specifically developed this dream for 2040. So three years ago, the planning ministry did a survey of 10,000 young people. And uh, young people, uh, who they, they defined as say 20, 20 to 40 years old, those that will be still active uh, in 2040. And the result of the, and they asked the question, What's your dream for yourself? What is your dream that you will have by 2040? And the answer is this. They want comfortable lives. And what does comfortable mean? They have the house of their own. They have a simple vehicle that they can use to travel. And they will be able to travel whenever they want to. In a safe environment in a peaceful country that is uh, safe and secure and they want to be able to enjoy closer family ties and ties with friends so that is the dream as you can see in the first uh, in our opening it was mentioned by the princess that let's know what the people feel so this exercise was done to know what the people want what they dream of. The reality is that the data that are being produced are still the usual macro indicators. So you have uh, GDP, inflation, income-based poverty. And so based on this dream by 2040, the new administration developed its development program, development plan, and the statistics office, the system, developed the statistical development program to support this dream, which means what data do we provide government to be able to know if the dream is being achieved. So in this plan, we still have the usual macro indicators, GDP, etc. But to relieve the anxiety of people, anxiety that, hey, I want that dream to happen, it seems not to be happening. We, this is the, this is, these are the data that we believe will be able to know the anxiety. Still the same macro indicators, but more granular. So looking at inflation, economic performance, economic growth, but not just on the national level, but going more into smaller groups. So what is happening to indigenous peoples? Are they enjoying economic growth? How about the effect of inflation, rising prices on the bottom 30%? So these are the types of data that we believe will capture anxiety. But we're also developing the non-income data and indicators. So for example, just a month ago, we released the multidimensional poverty indicator, which is the story of deprivations. And the 
the main message we gave to the government is Filipino families are still deprived in basic education. Half of our families don't even have one family member that has finished high school. So this is an alert, education. The other is inflation for the bottom 30%. Rise, uh, prices have been rising in the Philippines recently uh, from the, a 3% level last year to a 6% level this year. But for the bottom 30%, it's reaching 8% to 9%. So this captures the anxiety. How do the families, how will they be able to feed their children? Because the price, prices are rising, specifically of rice, which is the staple food of the Philippines. So more granular, the usual uh, data, but more granular. But the other way is quality of life, well-being. And this is where a very active civil society of the Philippines comes in. Uh, they are actually generating citizen-generated data. So we have this uh, social weather station. It's a nonprofit polling group. And they are the ones producing hunger uh, study, self-rated poverty, and quality of life. Uh, but going to the other mandate of my office, we also do the civil registration. So now we are looking at the data from civil registration. For example, teenage pregnancy, it's rising in the Philippines. If the girl is pregnant, she leaves school. The Philippines is the only country without divorce, aside from the Vatican. So we are noting that marriages are also lessening. So what's happening to our families? How can you have comfortable lives with better ties with family if you have such a situation? But we also produce interesting uh, data, which you think are trivia, but for me are not. For example, we release uh, annually the most popular names of baby girls and baby boys. And it's Mario, I guess. Mario. I'm sorry, Mario. Yours is not popular in the Philippines. <laughs> the more popular baby boy names are coming from the Bible. Nathaniel, Joshua, Gideon. We're a Catholic country. But it's interesting that maybe names are more princess names. Natasha. And so you can see the type of culture we have where people watch this uh, soap opera where you have that. So this is something that we are alerting behavioral scientists in the Philippines okay. on. So uh, more granular data of the same e economic indicators, income-based, but looking also at other indicators that are more realistic, looking at how they will help monitor the achievement of the dream of the Filipinos of comfortable lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and Johan, uh, we uh, are at your home. Uh, your institution, in fact, covers a broader range of country from Russia Federation to New Zealand. So uh, you are confronted with an enormous diversity. We have heard some aspect of this wide diversity uh, here up to now from the different intervention. Uh, but despite this big diversity, in terms of this anxiety and challenges, do you see some points that maybe are constant or common to all this wide area? <clears throat> Thank you very much, Mario. And uh, as a representative of the United Nations, uh, let me answer that through the prisms of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, we at ESCAP did an assessment of all 61 countries in Asia Pacific, and we find three very commonality uh, within all our countries. These are three goals where our region is actually regressing. We're going backwards. And Ravi already referred to one, which is the issue of inequality. Inequality of income, as measured by the Gini coefficient, is increasing in almost all countries, including China and Russia. As countries are getting richer, inequality is increasing. What is even worse, the inequality of wealth, that of the top 1% being equivalent to roughly the wealth 
of the remaining 50% <coughs> of the population, in some countries more, is also increasing. The second thing that we're seeing our region is a regression in the uh, sustainable development goal on governance. Uh, this is a tricky term, but for a lack of a better proxy, I would use a word to be frank and bold, corruption. Uh, corruption in our region continues to be unabated, and we as a region is going backwards in this particular goal. But the third and probably the most worrying and common throughout every country in the region is all the SDG goals related to the environment. Whether it's life above land, life below sea, climate change indicators, our region is going backwards. We are systematically damaging our environment and not taking enough care. In fact, as a Chinese uh, uh, gentleman uh, mentioned, the rapid economic growth has really come at some cost, and that cost is most manifested in our environmental indicators. I ask Ravi when he goes to Helsinki to also put the challenge of how we can use technology to better protect our environment in all its aspects. Thank you. Thank you. And Mario won, therefore. <laughs> um, we, you have heard that uh, Ravi uh, pointed out uh, this issue of uh, uh, research and development and in general uh, policy with a view that goes in this direction to endogenize more the phenomena of innovation, taking into account need of creating jobs and decent jobs. Now, in Latin America, when we look at the percentage of research and development out of GDP, and speak out of memory under your control, we are talking about 0 0.8 around. Less. Uh, less than 0 0.8, 0 even 0 worse. 0 0.5. Now, uh, Go if, to 0, 0, 0. Yeah, now, o OECD average is 2.4, and obviously in China, the percentage is much higher, and so on. So, Latin America is a country where the issue of innovation is crucial. <laughs> Uh, what do you think? Uh, would you agree on the possibility to define, or in the invitation recommendation, to define more generous and serious policy? And secondly, it's just f uh, for the public sector. In Latin America, there is almost a kind of re repeated lay motive. Uh, the private sector is the deus ex, ex machina that will arrive and will solve all the problems. Is this the case? Thank you very much. I think. I, I would like to take what Ravi said, and I think it is a crucial point. Uh, when we think about development, which are the new path, uh, many times, person like me, economist and political science, think that the micro context is the same, that the business model are the same, that uh, value change are the same. But uh, this micro revolution is really, really uh, deeply. It's, it's something that is changing business model, employment, network, capability, and everything is changing at a very micro level and that affecting employment and welfare and productivity. And I think uh, this is one of the most important points when, when we think about the new path of development, how we think in that. But it's not only about how we just spend it on research and development. That in Latin America is very low. If you compare research and development expenditure in Latin America with the country that are in, sitting here, please, we, uh, the match is finished. And we don't have partita, it's finished, everything. But, it's not only the quantity, it's the quality and the diversity of innovation that we have today. It's more digital, it's more network, it's another type of business. And for Latin Americans, it's very difficult to rethink about that because the region is very specialized in natural resources, but we can, we have difficulties to incorporate it there, this new technology. This is an enormous difficulty. We have to rethink 
how to do that, not only the, 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 the expenditure, the level of expenditure. This, is, I think, is an important point to rethink development. But I think there is another two points that Latin Americans have to rethink. It's not only micro technology is different across the world. That's, we agree on that. Second one is about trade and multilateralism. We think that the globalization, we think, you know, 10, 15 years ago, that the globalization is going to have the best end of the thing. And that is not the case. Everything is changing. We don't know how it's going to be the end of this history. And uh, when you rethink about development, when you rethink about the specialization, when we rethink about sectors, how to uh, create, for example, agreement on everything like that, you have to rethink that the idea that we have on globalization have changed. And really, we don't know what is the, going to be the new scenario. It's going to be bilateral, it's going to be regional, it's going to be sub-regional, micro, multilateralism, and there is another one that is very important, macroeconomics. You know, we think that many times in Europe and the United States you use standard macroeconomics, okay? We think that employment increase, wages increase, inflation increase, and everything is going to do good and fine. And what's happening in Europe and the United States? It doesn't happen that. Employment increase, wages don't increase so much, Inflation doesn't increase because wages increase, and we can has the difficulty to manage macroeconomics. And you know, the idea is how Latin America face the new context that is micro, macro policy that we can understand more how it's working really, and this new global context that is completely different. And clearly, we don't have ended a scenario to understand how to move on that. Thank you, Mario. So this first round is very, it's sending very clear messages. Uh, we see countries with uh, incredible success, at least in terms of economic growth, that are now rethinking their path of development, others that are facing clear difficulties and that needs to be addressed. Uh, we understand that there is a granular reality that we have to tackle better and at present is not so evident. Even if we understand that and if we can isolate some common problem, Ravi is recalling to us the answers that we are giving are not perceived by population as being satisfactory. Uh, let me make an example here because as I live in France, recently we have seen in the street people dressing a yellow jacket. There was a reaction against the measure of the government to increase the taxes on gas as pollution of the air is, is sensible. But in meanwhile, what has happened is that people have decided to move in many cases outside cities because uh, the cost of living in cities is too high and therefore they don't have a choice. They cannot choose to use other means of transport or, or change job, and therefore they have to simply to see reducing the, the, the cost of life. What is the reaction of the economies? No, the measure is rational. What is the reaction of the people? You don't understand us. So there is this, uh, this major problem uh, about the expectation. But now, uh, both uh, uh, Mario I indicates that our tools, in many cases, are wrong. Our capacity to understand the macroeconomic trends is uh, badly set or inefficient in a case where inflation is not taking place despite employment and so on. So, uh, there is a lot to think. And why international organization was one of the questions are uh, uh, addressing those issues. Isn't it a matter of domestic policy? Uh, when we speak about inclusive growth, aren't we making an intrusive growth uh, perspective? I think no. It's pretty evident here. Things are not clear. Either we sit down and we discuss among each other, either we realize that many of the solutions are interdependent, or we probably will not find the solution. Therefore, let me, uh, uh, in this vein, continue with a quick second round and ask you, uh, starting with uh, Zhang Laiyaming, uh, uh, how 
China's development strategy try to foresee and to take into account these new challenges? Uh, how do you do it? Uh, the DRC uh, is a structure. We have heard that there is also a strong need of local dialogue. How do you do it?我们这个中心啊承担的一个任务啊就是研究经济社会发展的前瞻性的一些问题所以刚才呃佩子里先生你讲就是中国未来面临什么挑战要往什么方向前进其实这是我们研究的一个重要领域现在我也同意刚才各
，涉及到整个宏观政策的规划，也涉及到微观层面的各种的激励措施，各种这些个过程呢，我想啊，下一步啊，我想在这个。呃，在国际范围内部的相互交流，我想啊，我们包括我们今天这种交流啊，会大家启发，共同寻找出一条新的路子来。还有一条重要的一条，在不确定当中可以确定的东西，就在于世界开放、经济一体化、相互交流合作、相互学习，总是有益的，总是能够让我们能够更好的。在吸取经验和教训的基础上，更好的前进的，我想就这些。嗯。Can't be more in agreement with this point.、Uh, and uh, and about Korea, so、oh, you identify the sources of uh, of uh, anxieties, but in general, how do you account for the risks? What do you do therefore in your everyday work to go one step further? 嗯 ，OK， let me uh, 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 talk about、uh, the most important risks that、uh, Korea faces.、Um, as in many、uh, other countries, the, the risks、uh, of Korea, I think, the most important ones is、uh, employment insecurity, <coughs> healthcare, rising healthcare cost. And the、uh, insufficiency of uh, uh, income of average people.、Uh, in order to cope with these risks, from the perspective of uh, uh, inclusive growth,、uh, Moon Jae-in government has done, I think, its, its best for the last、uh, one and a half year to increase employment security. It is. Turning a large number of uh, irregular uh, workers in the public sector into uh, regular uh, type of workers, and also to reduce high healthcare cost,、um, Moon Jae-in government has increased the coverage of national、uh, health insurance. We call it Moon Care program. Finally, to increase income level of the general population, government is increasing the hourly minimum wage up to ten dollars. It is certain that these must be great achievements, but it is also true that there are other、uh, arguments too. That is,、uh, the. The policies that、uh, Moon、uh, government are taking are overly goal-oriented and too、uh, stringent. Therefore, they need to be streamlined by increasing、uh, flexibility in policy implementation and also complementing with the other、uh, policies. Concerning this issue. I would propose one、uh, suggestion. In order for the Korean government's inclusive growth strategy to succeed and to be sustainable, I think governments should pay more attention on capacity building of Korean people. I think capacity building should be the core agenda. Of inclusive、uh, growth policy, the reasons are twofold. One is that it can foster creative and innovative capability of the whole population. Another is that it increases employability and also re-employability of the population. Taken together. Capacity building project can make inclusive growth and innovative growth both possible and sustainable. What、uh, NLC of Korea is doing is to develop policies for the government in order to、uh, increase the、uh, effectiveness of uh, uh, 
uh, policies for inclusive growth? Uh, very, very interesting, because already listening at the measure that you mentioned that the government is implementing now, you see, in fact, the idea of a strategy of inclusive growth. But the point that you are adding to it, the indispensable work in, within the public administration, because if you don't do that, then the implementation of the strategy will suffer deeply. This is designing as an answer to what we are discussing in this session, because in fact the point is how do you define a mix of policies and the sequencing of policies that allow to address the problem. Romina, here there is a space for you to work on the uh, uh, inclusive growth for sure. In fact, Ravi, I wanted to come to you uh, here because here we are listening these answers, these strategies, and there is also the example that I was making about, about France, because the economies confronted with some of these questions could answer naively, under my point of view, well, if the people are suffering, if there is a problem, let's compensate them. Let's give them some money that will address the sources of their suffering. The French government, confronting with this increase of price, is saying, we will compensate the rural population because they will spend. What do you think? Is this an answer? Or you, you mentioned to structural answer, education and research and development. But what about this traditional economic answer? So actually, thank you, Maria. I was going to speak to that. Uh, having started off perhaps with an unconventional suggestion, let me go back to the conventional frame. Uh, where you think of the pre-distribution, which is the education, et cetera, then market regulation, which is minimum wages, et cetera, and then redistribution after the event, those three, the, those three conventional pillars, if you like. And I think really uh, the main message there is perhaps an obvious message is that policy matters. <laughs> policy really does matter. And I want to use the example of Latin America and of China. Uh, Latin America, uh, you know, we haven't mentioned this, uh, and Mario One didn't mention it, uh, but in fact, in the last 25 years, inequality in Latin American countries has actually gone down over the last, over the last 25 years. So it has bucked the trend, and the question is why? Mm -hmm. And when we do the analysis, it turns out that roughly speaking, you know, obviously there are country variations, in equal, roughly speaking, in equal proportion, it's those three things, the pre-distribution, the market regulation, and the redistribution. The, the, uh, <clears throat> the pre-distribution of conditional cash transfers education, then the minimum wage stuff, and then uh, uh, redistribution as well. Those three things have gone together to, uh, to buck this trend, global trend. And I would say, I mean, far be it for me to talk about research on China with the, <laughs> with the vice minister present here, but certainly our research is showing that in the last 10 years or so, uh, inequality as conventionally measured in China <clears throat> is plateauing uh, uh, and maybe even turning down a little bit. Okay? So it went from here to here, and then it's now beginning to plateau. And when you ask the question why that's the case, it comes down to policy. It comes down to the government, through harmonious development, as I said, realize this has gone too far. Uh, we now have to do something. And then the westward strategy, investment, et cetera. So in, in a way, those conventional things still are very, are very important in the thing. But let me, let me uh, conclude by making uh, uh, two points. Mario, one is there are two types of constraints to these conventional policies, uh, uh, one of which probably wasn't present 40 years ago and one of which was always present, but we're now aware of it more. The, the constraint that wasn't present 40 years ago is, in fact, the constraint of globalization. Any country, as it tries to raise the resources to, to undertake these three things, uh, the pre-distribution, et cetera, you know, the, the, the corporates will say, you raise your tax rate here, I'm going to go over there. And they're, but they're saying the same thing over there. And if you just look at what's happened to statutory corporate tax rates, they've come down over, over the years. That was not a constraint. <laughs> that actually was faced by when the, when the great welfare states were set up and so on. Okay, so I think that's a new constraint, and that then requires initiatives like OECD's thing on, on, uh, on corporate tax rates and, and, and so on. I think that's, those are very important. The second thing, and this touches what your, your point, Mario, which is <clears throat> that as economists, we think of these three things, these three conventional things, as being very conventional e economic redistribution type things. Okay? But in fact, I, I think the next 10, 20 years, especially with the importance of redistribution, is going to be about the intersection between the economic argument, the economic efficiency of different types of redistribution, and the social acceptability of different forms of redistribution. It is not enough to do the cash transfer. It is not enough to just give cash in this way. One has to ask the question, is it a dignified form 
of transfer? Is it a dignified form of transfer? Mm -hmm. And the point is that although the economics might be, might be more or less similar across countries, although of course there are country specific things, I fully accept that, the, the social side of it is much more differentiated and much more country specific. And I think that's something that we economists, and I speak as an economist, really have to learn, learn about. So I would say even within that conventional frame, there are these two new things, newish things. One is the global constraints, and the other is, if you like, the social constraints that one, that one faces. Yeah, that is a social component that is becoming strong, uh, yes. strongly vocal, <laughs> maybe you know, sometimes in an incoherent way, but strongly vocal. Lisa, anything to add to these points? Well, the, the mention of social acceptability and dignity is really very, very important in my mind. And I would like to share that in the Philippines, we have, our government has tried other, these models of uh, conditional cash transfers. Now we have uh, free basic education and free tertiary education in state universities and colleges. But are they what our people need? How, how, how acceptable are they really? This is something that is uh, where our research institutions and academia should help the government on. But the government now recently uh, has uh, instituted the Philippine Identification System. It's our national identification system. And in my mind, this will actually give dignity to our people. And we have a lot of our people who don't have birth certificates. They cannot even access government services because they don't have identification. They also cannot open bank accounts because the requirement is two government-issued identification cards. So the issue is dignity. And part of dignity is financial inclusion. And so this is where, in the Philippines, uh, my office has this additional task again. And these are exciting times in the sense that with the identification system, we believe that uh, we will provide people dignity. And we will start actually, we are about 107 million now, and so we've committed to starting issuing this, uh, registering people. Those, the, we start with the more disadvantaged groups like uh, the poor as identified by our Ministry of Social and Welfare our indigenous peoples, our senior citizens, our elderly, uh, they need as well recognition. So that's, that's where we're headed um, in the Philippines as regards giving dignity to our people. A very important point. Um, sometimes you have the impression that we still are in a kind of atmosphere of Cold War, and at least in our analysis, the major emphasis has been put in flexibility of labor market because the danger were the rigidity introduced by unions and other intermediary corps. So progressively, they have been destroyed. Unfortunately, these intermediary corps were also the way through which the population was speaking to the administration uh, in a dignifying way because they were at least recognized. <coughs> So now we don't have a big mechanism for recognition, and maybe we will have to reinvent. And so, Anjo, uh, I have a question. Uh, with the present mechanism of international cooperation, do we have the tool that we need to at least address in part those matters? In many cases, the international cooperation was built with the idea to fight extreme poverty by means of transfer, leaving up people from extreme poverty, and then the market mechanism would have kept them outside. Are they still valid, these tools? Well, UNSCAP is a regional uh, intergovernmental body. We strongly believe that regional cooperation can help alleviate some national structural problems, such as Korea and most of Northeast Asia that faces great demographic challenges. Uh, not only does Korea not have youth, but people are getting much older. Uh, the issue on the corollary is many, many countries in the South have the reverse, rising youth population. Uh, a rising demographic and migration as a transboundary issue seems to be a logical solution that goes beyond a national border issue. We are seeing these type of issues, whether it's youth or whether it's uh, uh, 
workforce that can be mitigated somewhat through regional and international cooperation. But I would say the, the biggest issue sometimes is a solution, but national solutions also add to the global problems. Uh, I take a, a very well-known example of plastics thrown away in the streets of Kathmandu will eventually find its way into the Indian Ocean through the waterways, through the rivers. We are seeing a lack of cooperation that's much more nationally based and the results we are seeing is the damages to our oceans, whether it's just plain dumping of, uh, of matters or solid waste. Our oceans health are deteriorating and this is a national issue, national policies that can be changed that can add to the global good, that can add to the regional good. So the biggest toolkit that SCAP provides is a platform for dialogue for regional cooperation. And I believe many of the challenges we face, especially on the social and environmental front, and most certainly on the economic, we've done quite a lot with trade blocks and, and trading amongst countries. But I think a renewed effort is needed not to evil and victimize migration, but to use it for the benefit of national development to look at national policies on environment that have much more regional impacts and indeed global impacts that we as nations, we as governments, we as the public and even the private sector need to work in the context of a regional and global good. Yes, thank you. Mario Juan, therefore, let me put to you also a similar question because Latin America is a continent where there has been growth, less than in Southeast Asia, less than in Africa, but growth. Uh, and uh, this could have been a window of opportunity to address some structural problem. The point is that due to this growth, uh, many Latin American countries are getting out of the system of international cooperation because their GDP per capita is uh, high, higher than the threshold to benefit from ODA, for example. Mm -hmm. Therefore, does it mean that in Latin America the structural problem have been addressed? That therefore we don't need any more international cooperation because uh, growth has been there? Uh, thank you. I think it, the reason important, we think that there is I'm going to define three points, three important new points in the global context. The first one is about globalization. Now it's not a mer uh, more, uh, something that is uh, a certainty, it's uncertainty. We don't know we are going to finish, okay? It's clear. <laughs> Second one, thinking about what is economics and macroeconomic policy, again, there we have a problem, it's difficult. You can see what's happened in the United States and Europe to manage these variables, it's difficult too. Third one, have said my friend Rabbi, micro technological changes are, are huge, it's, it's enormous change of everything. And, uh, in this context, with everything is changing, and Latin America has <coughs> two, I think, two crucial. Inequality has been reduced, but not too much. Latin Americans continues to be the more inequality region in the world. Second one, productivity. Productivity in Latin America is like something that really moved very, very low and doesn't increase, and increase only in a specific sector. The question is, most of the countries got growth. Yes, that is true, but cooperation, the standard way to do cooperation, they say, no, we don't need more cooperation. But in this global context, with global uncertainty, macro difficulties, trade tensions, and the new technological wave, cooperation is more needed than ever, you know? It's more needed than ever. I think that you have here, the part of the world, China, Korea, my friend from, from the other commission, in the so on, Filipina, where cooperation with the other part of the world that is rethinking at this problem is more important than ever. Of course, it's not the same type of cooperation. It's another one. Are not only resources. It's technology, it's creating network, it's creating platforms, it's creating dialogue. It's other things. I think if you ask me the question, cooperation, 
more than never today is needed. Thank you very much. And this allow me to do a little bit of advertisement and is uh, to speak about the OECD. Uh, the OECD was the organization that originally distributed the Marshall Fund money. But then when uh, the funds were over, the country decided to continue to remain together, doing international cooperation, but it was not about money. It was about exchange practices and experiences. The problem at that time was that the OECD was composed by rich countries, severely affected by the Second World War, but rich countries. That's why John Fitzgerald Kennedy, looking at the table, suggested in 61 the creation of the Development Center, where we have fortunately 52 countries, China is member, Korea is member, India is member, uh, and, and therefore uh, this is my advertisement. However, um, I try to contribute to the idea of uh, Ravi, and my system that collects your question went broken. So I, uh, this obliged me to do a kind of low skill, my skill, low skill job. So I have an employment now, and I will try simply to summarize some of the questions that before it went broken, I saw on the screen. And several were saying more or less the following things. If now a people have an attitude in respect of economic growth uh, that is critical, if there are some element of dignity, identity, uh, recognition that needs to be taken into account, very often those elements take place in a specific place. People want to live better in a dignifying way where they live. Therefore, the question that I would like to address to everybody of you is, in the design of policy strategy, we have uh, international organization, in reality, killed some efforts that in the 60s and the 70s were done to give a space to local dimension. I'm referring to the, regional, the rural integrated program killed by World Bank, OECD, and others in the 70s. Uh, or a, a focus on urban development that was also uh, misplaced and cities were considered to be product productive as if you put people and firms together, they will be productive by definition, which is obviously not true. So how do we reintegrate this local dimension, in particular if the intermediary bodies are, have disappeared? How do we create a dialogue with people. Is true the local dimension? Who wants to, to pick it up? Please. We should have a neutral space for dialogue down to the local level. In my mind, those would be provided by people's groups, civil society organizations, and academia. So in the Philippines, actually, Unions are very still, very vibrant still. In fact, all government agencies have unions for their government uh, employees. And so the unions are the ones that provide alerts, provide dialogue. But for me, the academic institutions, they are also the, one, the place of neutral ground for dialogue to happen. So in my mind, that's, that's really how we should go go more local and sectoral with the help of neutral space. Table, where you put together different actors at the local level, that's the idea. Everyone free to express their opinions, debate and dialogue in a respectful manner. Anybody else want to intervene on that point? You don't like local, I know Mario. No, no, local, yes, I think it's important, but locally you have to put together local government, private sector, and civil society. You have to put three of them. And uh, uh, we think that private activity is becoming more and more important because there is an important transformation of production and technology that is changing the way have, you are in the territory, have, you move in there. On one side. On the other side, there is the issue, I have said my colleague, that sustainability has to put another issue. I think a local is one, is one of the table, but it's not only the only one of the table. We need more cooperation uh, 
between governments. Uh, for example, people don't want to speak about, but uh, we can continue to have so asymmetry in industrial policy, in technological policy, and no dialogue, and only dialogue about trade. I think this is an issue. <laughs> we need government to discuss about that, because really, behind this context, this tension, we have an intensity of different strategy in industrial and technological policy there. Any other uh, point? Ravi. Yeah, let me, let me just say that uh, one, I don't want to minimize uh, the issues on, on this uh, dignified form of transfer issue. Uh, uh, there are real issues. So let me just give you an example. Uh, take, take the case of, a, uh, of an unemployed steel worker. Uh, in the Midwest, in the US, or actually in, in, in China, let's say, okay, where for, whatever, for technological reasons, the job doesn't exist anymore. And the person has lost $1,000. The economist's answer is straightforward. If you, you write a check for $1,000 to this, to this person. And flexibly okay. side the market label. Eh? And flexibly side the market label. But you write $1,000. <laughs> uh, but of course, that, that's not, as I said, a, a dignified form. Of course, the person would rather have the $1,000 or in South Africa, the 100 rands or whatever, than not have it, mm -hmm. but that is not a dignified. Then you say, well, what is it that you want? Suppose the person says to you, I want my old steel job back. I want to earn my living through the sweat of my brow, to go into the factory, etc." But those jobs are not coming back, and that's the dilemma. I think that's the dilemma, because in fact, to keep that factory open, to maintain that thing, will cost you <laughs> twice as much as $1,000. Uh, any more indirect form costs you more. That, I think, is the, is the dilemma uh, of the economic efficiency of redistribution. We're not talking about efficiency in a, in a period, of the economic efficiency of redistribution versus the social acceptability of different forms of redistribution. So I don't think, I don't think one should minimize the dilemma, but on the other hand, uh, we, have to, we have to address it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but therefore, uh, here we see uh, parts of the answer. So we need the strategies that put in place industrial policy, was saying Mario, to define a uh, way to strengthen the economy and maybe also distribute the demand between low skill and high skill labor. In part, this strategy may be local. In many cases, economic <coughs> activity have a local span, and therefore this can be realized, but not exclusively. These two, our colleagues, statisticians that are in the room, uh, obviously uh, give a suggestion. All the data we are having on well-being indicators needs to have a local dimension as well. Uh, the, the unit of analysis cannot be only national when it comes and needs to take into account the inequalities that were described before. Okay, this was a question that I had in mind. We have still uh, some time for discussion, if I understand well from the organizer. Therefore, my question, it, I am ready now to open the floor to some question from the flow. Let's go back to the return of techniques, to ancient techniques. You will have to raise the hand if you want to address us. Here we have an end. We can take three questions. It's coming, it's coming. We saw you. This gentleman with the glasses. Please introduce yourself. Um, hello. Um, my name is Gerardo Leiva. I work in, in, in Inegi, in Mexico. And this is a question for Ravi. Um, um, it's about this uh, idea of uh, managing technological change in order to avoid its uh, negative impacts on the well-being of people. And um, I have uh, three questions on this. One is, um, how do you envision the, um, the intervention in this process of innovation in order to avoid its negative side effects? How to do it? And uh, the second point is, uh, in a globalized uh, um, world in which the process of innovation is also global, who should be in charge of doing it? And uh, third, um, uh, how should we control the unintended effects of messing with the process of innovation? And um, uh, a final point uh, related with the, the, what you mentioned about uh, the evolution of inequality in Latin America it might be just an illusion that inequality has been declining in the region because of the way we measure it. Uh, as, as, as you know better than I do, um, surveys are um, 
uh, truncated in the upper part of the distribution. And perhaps what is happening is that we have fewer, richer people that are more difficult to find in the surveys. Thank you. Yes, Ravi. So it's always the case that your students ask the most difficult questions. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for those, Gerardo. <laughs> Um, so let me start with the last one, which is a, which is a technical, uh, technical question. <clears throat> uh, and this is, of course, the point is very, very well taken, that uh, we have household surveys, and household surveys have, uh, as a technical point, have very well-known shortcomings. Uh, in particular, at the upper end, you tend not to capture things. And also, uh, at the very, very upper end, you tend not to capture. So in fact, when we've done this work on China, one pushback that we have had is, no, no, you're not really capturing <laughs> the super, super wealthy. When I walk down the streets, I can see with my own eyes these big houses, the big apartments, and so on and so forth. So how can you tell me that inequality is now beginning to turn down in China? I think that's a, that's a valid point. The only thing I would say is that it was the same data source, the same type of data which 20 years ago we were using to say that inequality has increased. Now, nobody complained then about, about the thing. So I would say there's a certain inter, if there's a certain intertemporal in, uh, inter consistency, then perhaps one can capture, but of course, I, I mean, I take, I take your technical, take your technical points. Now, uh, of, your, of your three other questions, I'll take the, uh, 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 the easier one, <laughs> which is, which actually I, I was going to raise the point, which is that in this area of, of R&D, of course, there's a, there's a global public goods issue. There will be underinvestment by any one country in, in, this, uh, in this type of R&D, or any type of R&D, which has global spillover effects. Why should, why should I invest if, in fact, the benefits goes to, uh, some of the benefit goes to other countries? So that's another reason why I think we need global, uh, global arrangements. And that's a point that I, and that my example of the CGIAR, the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research, was meant to, was meant to uh, uh, indicate that. How to do it, I, uh, the short answer is I don't know. Uh, but I want to pose the question. I want us to start thinking about it. Uh, rather than say, well, this is just too difficult for us to, uh, to begin to think about, because we are not thinking about it just now. I want us to start thinking about, uh, about these things. So I don't have the answers, but I think we have to have ask the question. You mean while the machine restart working? So you are aware of a question from the floor that says, do you see more or less economic integration between countries in the future pathways of development? And obviously, this is a very timely question as we have now the free trade agreement in Africa signed by more than 40 countries, and there are more and more emphasis on uh, regional integration. Here we have our two uh, UN uh, commission that maybe have a, a point on this. Do you want to? Um, over the past 50, 70 years, we have seen regional integration increase uh, throughout the world, whether it's between uh, regions or within regions. Asia and Pacific is no accessions. We are seeing sub-regional integration happening more than a broader regional pan-Asia Pacific integration. We see much more regional integration in the ASEAN, in the Southeast Asia context, through SPECA, CAREC in Central Asia, through SARC in South Asia, through the Pacific Forum in the Pacific. So the voices of countries through sub-regional platforms are increasing. <coughs> but what you're also seeing is sub-region to sub-regional uh, integration that's happening at a slower pace, of course, but it is moving. While the trend I see of regional integration is a positive sloping one. As time progresses and in this moment of time, we are seeing a little bit of a, a negativeness of multilateralism, a much more unilateral uh, view of the world. But I believe it's a, it's, a, it's a flow that bounces back and forth, but the trend of globalization, the trend of integration continues to be an upward one, and I foresee the future with more integration, not less. Ravi, here we have a question for you. What about universal basic income? This is a post redistribution measure. Uh, why should we use technology if we could use a measure like this? In part, you have already answered, but please. Oh, you want to share? Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, again, universal basic income, uh, if you like, falls into the third category of measures, sort of post, post 
market income redistribution. And, uh, you know, that it, and one can do a lot of, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of theoretical and empirical discussion of this, of this thing, uh, the, the fiscal costs of it versus the uh, incentive effects, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I mean, you know, I, uh, I'm instinctively, <laughs> instinctively for a non-targeted uh, system of transfers. That, that's my instinct in this thing. But I fully recognize that it's, it's an empirical question. Uh, in, each, in each case, one has to think, think things through whether, in fact, targeting this would be uh, fiscally uh, better, uh, whether there would be incentive effects uh, uh, which, which might counter this, et cetera, et cetera. But where I think the universal basic income is, uh, uh, disc discourse is where I think economists have less to say uh, is exactly this notion of, is that form of transfer socially acceptable? Is that form of transfer socially acceptable? And you know, the answer varies from society to society. Uh, Alaska has a form of universal basic income because what happens is Alaska's natural resources, uh, resource rents that which the government gets, essentially each Alaskan gets a check uh, uh, at the end of at, at, uh, every year on this thing. So there's no sort of issue of uh, loss of dignity or anything. They, they, they think this is their right and they, and they, they accept it. But in other contexts, if the, if the transfer is received without work, there is a, and, and in fact, people who have critiqued UBI, this is, the, this is one dimension on which they have critiqued it, that it is far better to have employment policies which generate the same amount of income for individuals than to have not had the employment policies but have transfer policies. So it's that debate, which again, certainly I as an economist don't feel uh, particularly uh, 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 that I can answer those things. But in terms of the economic aspects, I think, I think the arguments are relatively finely balanced one way or the other. Mario Juan, if technology is governed by public sector, will it affect the way technology is transferred? Yes, of course. Uh, it's, a crucial, it's a crucial point, but the problem is that you put before in the other, pa in the other part, you said the role of the public administration. What's happened many times, and happened in many of these countries, that public administration is captured by the private sector. And when you have private sector like Latin America and you have mm, so large, uh, important natural resources sectors, many times the power of those sectors is so important, so crucial to capture public administration and you lost the capability to use technology and transfer. Uh, we say that uh, we have a new opportunity on technology, but the problem is that public administration in the States is captured by the same type of industry and sector. And you have to broken that and to create more diversification New, more new entrepreneurship capabilities in the country. That's very good. Okay, in a certain sense here we have the reverse of an argument which is very often used, and is we should not put in place uh, industrial policy or technological policy because there is to be capture. And what Mario is saying to us is no, capture is there. The capture is already here. The point is that this policy may help in order to address the capturing of, uh, of the public action at present. Okay, we have discussed several aspects of pathways for development. This was the scope of this panel, and I think that the panelists have done a great job. First, because we have heard uh, some national experiences that are telling us <laughs> development or growth was here, we were capable to translate part of it into real development, improving well-being of population, but just part of it. And now we are facing challenges, in some cases even risk. And it's sure, we need new strategies in a new normal way, or uh, call in a different way, uh, inclusive growth strategy, but desperately we need those. Is the international di dimension and cooperation helpful in this perspective? Yes, it is. Why? Because national strategies are by definition national, but you learn by comparing yourself to somebody who is different, not for somebody that needs to be homogeneous. And to do that, discussion is welcome, and multilateralism serves in that purpose. Now, to address what? Well, to address the fact that traditional tools 
are now under threat. Why? Because people do not reason necessarily as the homo econo economicus that we have depicted in the past. Therefore, economic compensation uh, do not work necessarily for dignifying people that don't think are recognized enough. This touch also uh, the, the statistical dimension because we need new unit of analysis in order to address part of those issues, but it touched many more things, including more regional integration. So I'm very happy because I think this panel has at least addressed some of the questions that we had at the beginning, and it has for sure opened a uh, very helpful discussion that I will bring back home in order to continue to work. So I would like to ask you to help me in thanking the people of the panel because they have done a real good job. Thank you very much. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking the moderator as well as the speakers. Another round of applause for the great, fruitful discussion. Thank you very much.